thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my, main, my name is Miroslav Jaroš and it's Jirka Podivín. And uh, we uh, like to uh, introduce our non-profit organization, uh, PharmAI. Uh, we have uh, one target. Uh, we want to make in future fully automatic uh, greenhouse. That is a very long uh, term uh, plan. And in this moment, we're working on a few parts of these problems. We finally uh, find some solutions for, for part of these problems. But is the, in this moment, uh, we need more uh, sophisticated people for, for, this, uh, for this task. So uh, we are running things fully open source, obviously. Um, that includes models, data, and the infrastructure. Uh, during this presentation, we'll delve into a bit of what we are doing. And we'll also showcase some of our outputs and tell you how we arrived at those outputs. We also have our friend Jake Balash over here, who's supporting us through Base48. Uh, they have their boot at this conference, so unless you have visited them already, please do it now. You can visit them twice as well if you want to. Um, so yeah, um, first of all, we wanted to you know, uh, train some simple models for diagnosing plant diseases, even just recognizing plants. Uh, turns out um, there's relative scarcity of data about plants and botany in general. Um, there are some botanical data sets, but for the most part, they are kind of um, overly specialized. For example, just a couple of specific um, plant tissues, like separated leaves on a blank background or a handful of species. It's not um, exactly diverse. So we went big. And um, through our partnership with Mendel University, we have uh, started a seminar project for students and had them help us create a pretty decent data set of about 7,000 images. Uh, out of those, the students helped us label uh, over 5,000 of them. Uh, you can see a screenshot over there on the screen and a uh, link to the data set. Uh, it's right now on Hugging Face. Uh, it's a planned uh, data set for image segmentation. Uh, since we didn't get exactly a lot of diverse plants as much as we wanted, we have focused on their tissues, specifically the most important ones and the most obvious ones. Uh, leaves, stems, that includes uh, branches obviously, fruits and flowers. Unfortunately, we were taking pictures during autumn and while there is a plenty of fruit during autumn, there are substantially less flowers. Um, so unfortunately, that's not what's there, but we get plenty of fruit. Uh, vine, tomatoes. Uh, yes, we're using fruit in the most general sense possible, not in the strict botanical sense, but in the economic sense. So like everything you can eat. Um, we got lots of stuff there. Um, and there's an interesting point how we made this. Um, so uh, would you like to say a few words about the software we used for that, Mira, or is it? Okay, uh, thank you. <coughs> we use for this uh, problem Label Studio. It's a special software for labeling and so on. Uh, it's uh, not easy for preparation configuration server, but they have uh, possible use cloud. In this moment, we have some cooperation with owner this uh, label studio, and our students use uh, this label studio. And uh, finally, product is uh, on hugging face. It was a first step what we want to do, and I have planned uh, this year uh, use uh, the same thing but by wide, uh, video, and it will be a new progress because uh, there is a way. Uh, I think it's in future uh, make label in 3D video because we need uh, this information we lost. Uh, if you have only f picture, you don't have everything uh, around you. And that is the way how can we take more data and more special things. So uh, this is it's not only one program, but we start with Label Studio. Maybe uh, you know some other programs and they are better. So we'll be after uh, this discussion, we will be happy if you say us, uh, we can use these or these things. Thank you.
Yeah, so um, one of the things we used in conjunction with Label Studio was uh, SAM, uh, Segment Anything model. Uh, it's a model provided freely by Meta. Um, it's effectively a general model for segmentic segmentation. And um, it kind of made this whole thing possible because uh, masking or creating those masks on images usually involves people painting pixel by pixel or you know highlighting a whole area by hand and um, telling a bunch of students in like second year of their you know minor to do that is uh, not wise because um, they're lazy. I'm saying that out loud. So we kind of uh, employed this model and integrated it with Label Studio to help them with that. Um, no, the model didn't do all the work. It did 90% of it. And how did it do that? Basically, the student chose the part of plant they want to highlight, then they clicked on it, and the model computed the mask for that part. It turns out this approach is remarkably accurate. Um, we had very few mislabeled cases, and uh, especially when the students focused on the most visible parts of the plant, and the plant was relatively close. Uh, when it came to leaves, fruits, stems, practically anything, the masks were exceedingly accurate. Um, of course, um, we could have done the same thing with any other kind of objects. The approach is general enough. And it really helped us uh, narrow down uh, what we need to gather because we didn't need to uh, you know, wait for a long time before we actually get to the point where we have enough masks to work on something. We had some, some sort of workable sample pretty quickly. Unfortunately, and I have to say this, um, despite the fact that the process was fast, the label studio was not. Um, we won't focus on that, though. Instead, we'll move on to other projects we are running with Mendel University, specifically uh, FarmBot. So as, we meant, as Miro mentioned at the beginning, we are trying to implement in the future, possibly, a fully automated greenhouse. That wouldn't work without a worker. And uh, there's a nice project already implementing the worker part, which is FarmBot. Uh, we have constructed FarmBot, another open source thing, in the basement of Mendel University, and we have put it inside of a grow tent. Grow tent. Yes, that kind of tent, um, the kind of that grows plants. Um, there's a specialized lightning. We got sort of a CNC running around on rails, you know, watering, picking, doing whatever we want. Right now it's mostly watering because we have nothing to pick. Um, and we're using that to also uh, do some other experiments. And uh, Miro, would you like to say something about how it was uh, how yeah, it's yeah. running down there? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting process because uh, we don't have uh, sunlight. We have only light, uh, violet uh, light. And it's very interesting. We, we saw after the new slide something more about acoustic emission. But in this moment, uh, we taste in this product. Uh, there was uh, some few products, and it will be for me. Well, it was interesting because uh, when I try it, it was from from my uh, gra grandmother. Very early, if you buy uh, something in in a shop, you have uh, these tomatoes or potatoes or something else, but it is don't good taste. Sometimes it happens because it's uh, maybe January, February. But with this light, we taste it, and it was great. I don't know how it happened. Maybe maybe this light is so perfect because there is a big spectrum of, of light. But uh, for me, it was uh, very exciting because this is possible without sunlight made some products. And that, that is the reason why, why we want to try it. And there is more things what can be uh, done for, for it. So right now, we're using that same tent. Um, to work on another project of ours, which is listening to plants. Um, it may sound weird, but we're doing it. Um, basically, uh, the same way you're, reson uh, you're listening for resonances in a construction, let's say a steel construction or a building or whatever, you can listen for, to and record acoustic emissions in anything, including plants. So what you see over there is the sensor attached to one of those poor tomato plants. And uh, we're recording the activity 
from there. At first, we were not exactly sure how that's going to work out. So um, we just tried if it's going to do anything. Um, we didn't know, but turns out the results aren't that bad. Um, sorry. Yeah, thanks, one. So this is the recording from a couple of days. Um, you may notice that some things are fairly obvious on, in, right there. Um, so right over here, we get these peaks. So that's when uh, this, the light was on. And over here, and here, and sometimes over here, we've got cases when the water was applied to the pot. So these were clearly detectable from the very beginning. Um, just by looking at them, we, because we know when we were watering those plants, because we calculated, and we know when the light was turned on and off. It, there's a lot of noise there, but it's not like you cannot recognize where the interesting bits are. In fact, uh, the blue lines you see over here, uh, that's a simple quantile-based uh, anomaly detector uh, being run on these data uh, with practically zero calibration just with some simple k-means-based score to assign anomaly scores. And we were able to you know, create this sort of pseudo model to detect the, you know, the interesting bits for us. Um, of course, uh, you can do the same thing with a deterministic function, just comparing the running means and get the edges of those you know, big peaks. Um, and uh, that would work as well. Then again, uh, this way you can see the nice anomalous course as well. And you can see what were, where were the most like, interesting bits and by what measure. So that's also interesting for us in the long run. What we're trying to do right now is we're trying to figure out if we can also detect more esoteric things, like uh, if, it's some, if there's something eating the plant, or if the plant is dying for something, or if it's growing a new fruit, etc. Um, we don't know if we can detect that yet, because the tomatoes have not been growing for long enough, and there have been some interference in the meantime. I believe we had to tear some of them up. Or yeah, yeah, that is very complicated. Uh, as I can say, we, we try more things because we uh, use uh, LED. Now this we, we test it in uh, sunlight and other stuff. So it's not easy to find the difference be, be, because uh, there are many, many acoustic emissions from machine and people, light. If, if, you, if you think about it, everyone, uh, if you sit here, you have some light too, some, some emissions. So that is a very, uh, this, this, this thing is very changed uh, in time and that is, that is the problem all times. So uh, we, we trust, we, we trust the things, uh, we can make uh, some special place where will be this acoustic emission in the same, same, same time in the same place. We can find something new and after uh, we can uh, use uh, this information with other, other things and uh, uh, make, make some decision for it. But this, in this moment we know uh, we have uh, start uh, light and uh, off, on off and we know uh, where is the water is, uh, is uh, on the plant so we can start with this model and find this information and uh, we hope in future will be more information so if you if you have some interesting about this project we will be happy if you if you join us too yeah obviously um, since we are a non-profit like you can obviously join us and you know take a look at what we're doing contribute a little um, by the way, um, what I didn't mention, like about these acoustic emissions, um, so those are fairly weak. That unit you see over there, um, that's volts, and over here you see one minus six e minus one e minus six. So we got like six zeros before we get to any interesting number. Um, that's fairly weak in terms of voltage, and uh, that necessitates uh, pretty sensitive equipment. Thankfully, we got uh, great advice on the project, and we were able to filter out almost all of the interference. Uh, that's why we're seeing something like this. If you didn't filter anything out, you would probably see just a bunch of noise. So this is after some calibration. Uh, not a lot of calibration, but a substantial amount of calibration. Specifically for filtering out things like lights, because otherwise we'd be we would be detecting uh, noise coming from those LEDs. Yes, LEDs do make some noise although it's fairly weak because, you know, there's current in there and sometimes there's vibration because of coils and sources and such. 
So that was already filtered out. So no, we are not accidentally recording the lights literally being turned on and off. We are recording the, recording the plants. We made sure of that. Uh, we even covered one of the plants with a bag to know if it turns off this way. It did stop beeping this way. So we know this is them being shined upon. And um, we've also done some preliminary research on things like uh, how do the plants react to specific stimuli. Uh, we tried uh, hurting the plants in various ways. Uh, I, I remember applying a lighter to one. Um, but uh, I, I can't be 100% sure that it worked like that. I mean, like it was still before we were sure about the calibration. So, I mean, it's possible I just tortured a plant for no reason at all. Um, I don't, I, I mean, at some point you have to try things, right? Uh, we're going to do that again. Like if this project goes on for more time, we're going to have to torture those plants even more. Like there's going to be a, there's going to be a whole range of things we're going to do to them. I'm not kidding here. Like at very least some virological things. So, um, but, uh, it's something we're working on very hard right now. And, uh, of course, we're throwing away most of this because, like, for us, only one column of this data from the sensor is interesting, the voltage. Um, the rest is pretty much just trash. But uh, given enough time, we're pretty sure that we can get to something way more interesting than just seeing if the lights are on or off. Which brings us to some, you know, sort of call of action for action. Like, if you have ideas that could contribute to our effort, you know things about image classific uh, well not necessarily image classification but image analysis or acoustic analysis or automation in general like industrial automation uh, we would be more than glad to see you um, among us uh, you, we are you are invited to see the projects that are happening at Mendel University uh, we can take you to the base okay that sounds weird um, we can <laughs> we can show you the robot <laughs> Okay, we can show you the robot, and uh, we can even show you those plants, so you know they are well and unharmed, mostly. And um, like um, everyone is free to contribute. We're planning on open sourcing all of our, all of our outputs, as we have open sourced the data set already. And uh, once the, you know, the greenhouse is actually running and uh, we have it in a working order, we're also planning on, on open sourcing that. Uh, right now, there's not much to open source regarding the greenhouse itself because, I, as I noted, it's in the basement. So not really a greenhouse yet. I, I, I yeah. Thank you. Uh, Eka is a very good speaker, so I'm not, I'm just like him. But I want to show you something very interesting because we find it. Uh, there is a special part, uh, as you can see on this picture here. You can measure uh, what, what voltage is and we find there not this one and this one don't have the same voltage. So it is a very necessary if you want uh, the same measure and the same values you have to use from uh, same series. So when this uh, product is uh, created, it's not possible again make this, this decision. It's not so so big uh, values uh, different, but if I show you here, it was about uh, 500, yeah, and other have about uh, 1700 or something. Else. There is necessary make some some uh, difference between uh, this problem because it wasn't uh, made at the same time. If you know it's uh, from electrician and another part, if you create some uh, new new things, it's not sometimes <coughs> possible made uh, same measure. It's, it's hard to explain, but uh, if I show you our experience, experience, there is a necessary if the company buy uh, these uh, things for for uh, research necessary by the same series is there is really thing yeah? that is the problem because the the information after that will will be have difference but it's possible so um, simply put like different sensors can sometimes make widely different measurements even though they are practically the same on the paper 
uh, we found out the hard way, but it's possible to compensate for fairly easily. Once you know that, it's just a matter of calibration and some normalization. Um, anyway, I think right now we have about enough time for some questions, and we can uh, take questions from the audience if there are any. Any questions? Okay, a uh, gentleman with a red lanyard. Please don't photograph him. So, yeah, uh, right now, we don't even know for, yeah, so uh, I'll repeat the question. The question was, when do we think this can be commercialized and this looks pretty capital intensive? Uh, yeah, it does look capital intensive because it kind of is at this point. To be honest, at this point, we're not 100% sure that there is, an, is even a reason to commercialize this because we don't know if it actually can record things that are interesting. I mean, at this point, we know we can get information out of it that we can get an easier way somehow already. I mean, we know when the sun is up. <laughs> but maybe if we figure out how to detect the parasites burrowing in it or maybe, you know, something spreading around, then that would be interesting. Now, of course, it is capital intensive. The good news is you don't have to plug the sensor into every plant. So you can just plug it into a couple in each plot or one in each plot. And you can focus on the more, shall we say, long-term investment. So for example, you don't have to use tomatoes. You can use trees instead. Like tree is fairly long-term investment for agriculturalists or so we, shall we say arboralists. It takes a while until it grows to the point where it can actually bear fruit, and if something goes wrong at any point during that period, yeah, that's it, the investment is gone. So that would probably make even more sense than tomatoes. You know, tomatoes is just like one year, but let's say a uh, apple tree, that's, um, that's supposed to bear fruit for years, decades, and it would be very valuable to know if something's spreading around in your orchard. So that's, uh, that's one of the ways we can focus. Um, any other questions? Okay, a gentleman with the tattoos. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we have been thinking about that. Uh, there was actually, and I think it still is, one vertical farming company here in Brno. Unfortunately, from the last time I heard about them, they didn't do very well financially. So the problem is, uh, as the gentleman with the red liner noted, um, this thing is fairly capital intensive. Uh, this thing meaning the vertical farming. And uh, while it is kind of sexy, I don't know yet about a company that would successfully run it on a large scale without a lot of VC funding. And I mean, like, I don't know about a company that didn't run out of the funding and didn't fail. Like maybe you know, maybe you know some about some, but like from what I've read and from what I've researched, this line seems like something that's very obvious, you know, like let's put it in a building. We have plenty of buildings, it's close to the city, we can get the fruit air right. But turns out there's some issues there. Like for the first for the first part, like um everything that normally is provided by well, nature, let's say nature, even though it's not nature even on the field, but let's say nature. You have to provide yourself explicitly. It's not like you can just guess. It has to be right on the first try. So the sunlight is one obvious thing, but that's easy. Um, fertilizer, also relatively easy. Microbiome, oh, no, that's not easy. It's very hard because we don't know what's in the soil. For the most part, we have no idea, really. Uh, we are doing some soil analysis sometimes, you know, on the microbiome, but it's not really comprehensive. Um, we're mostly caring about things that infect people, not about things that are symbiotic, for example, for the plants. And um, practically anything to do with pests, yeah, good luck. If something starts spreading around in that you know, big area filled with food, um, you're done. So all of this together means that you have to take about a bunch of other things, you have to invest more money, and at the same time, the farmer who just grows things 
on his field, sometimes applies pesticides, sometimes provides um, some sort of uh, fertilizer. He doesn't have to care about that. It just kind of works. So that's what you have to compete with. But so far, I haven't seen that working out. But uh, maybe there's a company that it make, could make it work out. We have some uh, uh, talks with uh, other like um, normal, well, traditional uh, agriculturalists. Uh, for example, um, in, when it comes to vineyards or orchards, you know, stuff like that. But it hasn't yet been applied in practice. Right now, it's just mostly research. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, any others? Okay. Uh, gentleman with nine, as in rail nine, <laughs> on his T-shirt. Um, yeah, so I'm not a soil specialist. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question was, uh, is there an efficient way to see in real time what's in the soil and measuring the contents of nitrogen, other nutrients, and et cetera? Um, so I have to say I'm not a soil specialist. I'm a computer scientist and software engineer. So I have to, I, I honestly double in agriculture, although I went to agricultural university. But uh, I haven't seen a cow during my studies. Uh, but to the point, um, well, unfortunately, I, as far as I know, there isn't. Uh, because for the most part, to get chemical analysis out of any material, you have to kind of ground it down and uh, you know, apply regions to it and whatnot. That's not very conductive to things growing in that thing, uh, that thing being the soil. You can get pretty good readings about moisture and some things outgassing, you know, like if there's something producing um, emissions of gas, you can get that without disturbing things. But that's pretty much it. Um, the microbiome is the same. You take a sample, then you have to wait a while for it to cultivate. So um, not a real time thing, unfortunately. Um, maybe there is a way, uh, because if you use uh, acoustic emission, there is a possible way how to find it, and th this is uh, what we show you because uh, there have to be done um, very much research because we think uh, the plant talking be between uh, others. So that is the way how can we uh, find some solutions and if we uh, decode this information, we can say, yeah, that is a, that is a soil something. Yeah? I, I think it's way, but uh, in this year not, maybe in future. And it can be helped done with uh, some models or something else. That's it. Yeah, I would just like to add one more thing. Um, there's actually an interesting point here. You can think about a plant as already being a sensor array. It's kind of like just growing there, so why not plug into it? Um, anyone else? Any questions? Okay, um, the gentleman with yellow t-shirt. Um, it was in a matter of like minutes, <laughs> individual, oh sorry, uh, I'll repeat the question again. Uh, so what was the uh, time of response to the lightning change uh, for the plant? Was that the question? Yeah, okay, so the response was like in matter of minutes, units of minutes, not, not tens of minutes, it was, yeah. Uh, we have some new thing in research, um, and some research uh, show us there is maybe seconds. But the problem is because the plant uh, in, inside is uh, starting about two minutes, something change. So uh, we don't know why, why it happened. Sometimes it's uh, really, really fast, and sometimes it's not. So it's uh, in, uh, for research now. So we will see. Maybe next year we can give you right, <laughs> right uh, information. That's, that's all. Sorry, any, any other questions? Okay, um, the gentleman in the blue t-shirt. Yeah, we have a few questions. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the question from the chat was, I know that now, thank you. The question from the chat was like, he, uh, the 
the one asking questions would be interested in seeing if there's a difference in responses between the watered plant, the dry plant, and whatnot to the lightning uh, scenario. Um, so we don't have recordings from that for that yet. I would imagine there would be a difference, but I cannot say that with certainty. Um, I would expect so, but uh, we haven't run this on a completely dry plant yet. I mean. I imagine the completely dry plant would have fairly low activity, but um, like moderately dry plant would probably do something. But I cannot say that for sure. Okay, before we uh, let everything die at least once, we can't be sure about it. That sounds bad, but it's true. Okay. Uh, any other question? Okay, uh, gentlemen, back. Yeah, so the sensor is actually, yeah, yeah so uh, the question was, uh, what, is sensor, what is that sensor if it's a voltmeter? Uh, how does it make sense? Uh, so it's not a voltmeter, it's sort of like acoustic emission a detector. Think about it as a very uh, sensitive microphone. It only records things in volts as a convention, you know, because it's closest to the, you know, type of thing it's recording. It also records in decibels, but those are pretty much identical. In this case, it's just, uh, sorry? No, 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 this is, um, yeah. So the question was if we could use like directional microphones and whatnot to go for that. Um, unfortunately, no. Uh, the microphone has to be in direct contact with the tissue. Uh, if you try to do this without the direct contact, those vibrations will get lost in the noise in the surrounding area. Uh, there's just too much of it. You even have to make sure that the sensor is attached close enough. You know, it's not loose. We're using uh, conductive gel specifically to make sure that the area of contact is as large as possible. Um, the same technology is being used to analyze stresses in large structures. So if you've seen... Uh, let's say, big power plant with that cooling tower, you know, made of concrete. Uh, probably, while it was being built and tested, they used something similar to measure stresses in that. It's actually one of the areas we're going to try to focus on at one point. Once we verify this is even possible with high-tech equipment, we're going to try to figure out how to do it with lower-tech equipment. But if we figure out that we can't do it with high-tech, well, there's not going to be any point in figuring out if we can do it with low-tech. So. That answers one of the questions about the capital, I believe, at least partly. Okay, I don't know how much time we have left, but I guess we have time for a couple more questions. Okay, uh, the gentleman with the, with the lanyard, with the red lanyard again, sorry. Okay, so the question was if we know about data sets that could be used for, uh, you know, diagnosing plant diseases in personal garden. Uh, there is one data set that's focused on question of diseases specifically. It's uh, called Plant Village, I believe. Um, there's one unfortunate aspect about it. Um, it's very imbalanced. It's got like lots of samples for handful of species, but barely any for others. And the worst part is that it's only um, practically just samples, single leaf samples on blank background. It's not very useful unless you are gonna cut, going around cutting off leaves, putting them on tables. I mean, it's probably that probably you could train something that would work, sort of. We've seen decent results out of it sometimes, but often enough, it just didn't seem to make sense. Um, it requires a lot of manual intervention to use in practice. Uh, but I suppose, if given enough time and maybe a half a decent GPU, you could uh, make something that would work on your you know, garden and uh, work pretty well if it was one of the plants that's in the data set. Okay, um, one more question from the gentleman with the tattoo and the motorcycle helmet. Well, um, 
the question was if we have heard uh, plants scream in pain. Um, I mean, yes, but uh, um, I mean, like not with our own ears, but uh, it showed up. The unfortunate, I mean, like it's 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 hypothetically possible that it was due to the things we have done to them, but they were not reacting to them, and it was something that we were doing at the time that caused. But yeah, pretty much yes. We know that they react to stress, you know, physical stress, m mechanical specifically. Uh, let's put it this way: I, we used scissors. Okay. And so, uh, oh, I, uh, one thing is when don't have water. They have the last laugh brief, yeah, really, when it died. We have, we have this information to yeah. see. They kind of like, just, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're out of time now. Uh, thank you for all the questions, but we'll take more after we're finished here. Thank you very much. Thank you.